sharp declines in the price of oil, disastrous treasury auctions, and reverse repo falling below $1 trillion. What an eventful week it has been. Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today I want to break down what happened this week in markets and global macro, as well as give you guys an economic orientation heading into the holiday season. Today's video is sponsored by River. The Bitcoin Layer is so excited to be sponsored by River and partnered up with this amazing Bitcoin only exchange. Make sure you guys go check out river.com slash TBL. There's a special offer for you if you go to that link. And understand that River does not keep your Bitcoin on a third-party custodian. River has a multi-signature storage solution so that your Bitcoin, when you purchase it through River, they're not being held by another company. And not to mention, River encourages you to get your Bitcoin off of the exchange as soon as you can. And what better way than to use Lightning Network? So make sure you go check out river.com slash TBL today. Okay, let's start with oil. Early in the week, we saw sharp declines in the price of oil. But why? What's going on in oil? And what does it tell us about what's going on in the rest of the economy? Well, let's take a look first here at the oil price. What you can see here is a recent decline in the price of oil from the mid 90s to below 80. We're looking here at Brent crude. But the more important thing to take away here is the lower highs that oil is making over the last year plus. Now, keep in mind, we have two wars going on around the world, both of which should have implications on the energy market. But instead of it driving the price of oil higher, oil prices are declining. And why might we wonder, are these prices declining? It has to do with demand. Now, when the global economy is weak, we see the input for most of economic activity, which is oil, decline in demand and thus prices decline. Look back at what happened in the end of 2019, begin of, beginning of 2020, heading into the pandemic. We see oil decline from $70 down to $20. Now, of course, this was a once in a century event with the pandemic and global shutdown of economies. But we have to keep in mind why oil declines when the economy slows down. And it really comes down to everything that we do uses oil. So when the consumer is slowing, you can expect that to show up in the price of oil, not just because mom and pop are going to the gas station less, but because the entire world of global commerce is slowing down its consumption of oil. And let me show you a headline that tells us a little bit more about what's going on with the economy and specifically the demand for oil. Look at this headline from FedEx. FedEx encourages pilots to fly American Airlines as freight traffic slows. This is a fascinating headline that we're seeing here from Bloomberg. We see that Freight Waves reporting FedEx telling its own pilots, go fly for American Airlines for their regional carriers because we are seeing lower freight traffic. And the exact quote here is from FedEx, given the softness in air cargo demand across the industry and current FedEx flight operation staffing levels, we shared information about this opportunity for pilots to go seek worse work elsewhere. So this is something that is very troubling from a global macro perspective. And when we think about the price of oil, responding to what else is going on in the economy, not just geopolitical conflict and war, but a shock lower in aggregate demand. These examples from FedEx are something that we can look at. Now, I have another chart for you here to get into maybe another reason why oil is declining in price, and it does have to do with the demand for economic activity. We're looking here at a used car price index that we've started to track lately. Now, the index is here in maroon, but the change, we have uh, signals for you here in orange, the change year over year is in orange here. So on the right-hand side of your graph, you see negative 4% year over year in 
year over year prices in this used car index. And look back at the maroon line. What you can see here is that during the supply crunch of the post pandemic era, used car prices spiked. Now, these prices are still materially above where they were back in 2020. However, the sharp decline in isolation here says nothing about the global economy and might say something more about just the dynamic in the auto sector. But if we look at what's happening with FedEx telling its pilots to go fly for American Airlines and the oil price declining, then we can start to see that maybe this is all part of the same story. Now, what happened in tandem with falling oil prices this week? We saw falling treasury yields. And that's something we'll get back to in a second here. But I want to keep that in mind as we talk more and more about what's going on in the economy. When you see oil decline in price, it could be a million different reasons. But when you see it decline in price along with the oil gold ratio, along with treasury yields, along with what we're seeing in the rest of the data, then it starts to ring some alarm bells. Okay, here's the last chart I have for you specifically on oil, but it once again applies to the rest of the economy. You guys are familiar with NFP. This is the non-farm payrolls number that we get on the first Friday of every month. Last week, we had NFP come out. The jobs number was decent as it has been in the last several months. It usually is revised lower. So we don't necessarily tend to look at the headline jobs number that often. We do, however, look at the unemployment rate. We look at wages and we try to look deeper into the data and see if there's anything we can extract. So I have a number here for you using the transportation and warehousing portion of the economy. So when you see an X number of jobs were added this month, actually that number is a contribution of a bunch of different sectors, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics tracks. So this number that we're looking at here is the transportation and warehousing payrolls data, but instead of showing you the number of jobs, I've shown you the year over year change. And what do we see? negative year-over-year -year change in the total number of people employed in the transportation and warehousing sector. Now, this number is somewhere between 6 and 7 million people right now, but it's not just the number of people that matters, right? It's the change and the direction of the economy. Now, look at, I've drawn a red line across zero to show you when this number is expanding or contracting. And what do we see here looking back at the last 25 years? The number of people employed by the transportation and warehousing sector year over year declines going into or in the middle of recessions. Look back in 2020, 2021, this number fell below zero. Then once again in 2008, then once again during the pandemic. And here we are once again with this number falling below zero. This means that right now versus last year, there are less people employed in this sector and bringing it back to oil once again here, why is oil declining? Because global demand is going lower for oil, oil products, including gasoline, jet fuel, etc. Now, what does the transportation and warehousing sector have to do with oil? It is the demand for moving stuff around the world, global commerce of physical goods. Now, think about the number of people employed in this sector falling relative to an oil price falling, and that you can see that they are sides, two sides of the same story, potentially, right? I'm not saying anything authoritatively here. We're rather giving you our research opinion on what is happening using the data. People often ask me, what do I read on a daily basis to get my information? Well, Really what I'm doing on a daily basis is looking at the data, trying to form my own opinion using the numbers themselves. And using these numbers, I can tell you that what we're seeing is a contraction in global demand. Remember also that we have shown you in, in the past the, sh the chart of global trade. Global trade is also by the metric used uh, in the Netherlands and their economic bureau that number is between three and 4% decline year over year in global trade. So that dovetails with what we're talking about here. Now let's get into the next chart. Yesterday, 
On Thursday here in the U.S., we had a 30-year treasury auction. The day before that, we had a 10-year treasury auction. And there were a lot of headlines made by how terrible, terrible the auction went yesterday in the 30-year part of the curve. But I have a bunch of asterisks for you here, as well as an explanation. So let's start from the beginning. What are treasury auctions? Well, you guys know treasury securities are the debt instrument used by the U.S. government. They use this instrument to borrow money so that they can spend it. So when the treasury comes to the market to raise money, it does so in an auction process. We also know that the treasury auction securities across the entire yield curve from as short as one month to out to 30 years. Now, every week there are treasury auctions, treasury bill auctions, note auctions, bond auctions, inflation protected security auctions. There are auctions going on all the time in the treasury market. And at the same time, all of those securities are trading in the secondary market, right? The primary market means the point at which these treasury securities are sold into the market for the first time. So freshly issued, the primary market is the auction market. The secondary market are the numbers you see on your screen when treasuries and treasury yields go up and down in price. So what do we? what is the signal that we can get from treasury auctions? Let's start there. So let's use uh, an example of Sotheby's and fine art. And let's pretend that a painting sold 20 years ago for $10 million at auction. That painting went into some person's vault or went into their house and hung on a wall or maybe into a museum hung on a wall for 20 years. Then that painting comes out and is put up for auction once again. The client goes to Sotheby's, Sotheby's auctions that painting and it sells for $100 million. Now that painting has two price points in the last 20 years, $10 million and $100 million. But there's no secondary market for that painting, meaning there's no actual market to see what the price would be if it traded today, tomorrow, yesterday. So that $100 million price of that painting can be considered a very static, static price. Static in that it doesn't move. Now take treasury securities on the other hand. Treasury securities have a very deep, robust, and active secondary market. That means treasury securities have a price at any minute of the day. Auctions take large amounts of new treasury securities, dump them onto the market, and ask the market for a clearing level. So treasury auctions are important for clearing prices of large chunks of new treasury securities. However, in the moments before, days before, moments after, and days after, the secondary market is always moving in price. So, while auctions and auction statistics can be important, the auction clearing level relative to where it where the price was in the moment before, I believe is not the greatest signal that we can take. Rather, the price of that treasury bond in the days and months after the auctions can, is the higher signal. Okay, I tell you all this now to explain what happened yesterday. The treasury, 30-year treasury bond going into the auction was yielding about 4.7%. The clearing level of the auction was above 4.75%. So that's called a five basis point tail. Tail meaning the number of basis points above the auction level in the one second before the prices came out in the clearing level. So we can see that there was a five basis point tail. It means the number of basis points back or how weak the clearing level was relative to the price going in was one of the worst auctions in history. That is a fact. That's what we know. But Treasury yields were at 5% just a couple weeks ago in the 30-year part of the curve. So when they went from 5 to 4.7, having the auction come in at 4.75 must be put into context of previous yield levels and the prices, as well as what happened in the hours and days after, 
And what do we see right now going on is that the Treasury yield on the 30-year part of the curve went above 4.8, but is now trading back toward 4.7%. So even below where this massively disastrous auction clearing level was. Now, I tell you guys all of these things to keep it in context and not get swept away by the headline of one of the worst treasury auctions of all time. It was one of the worst treasury auctions of all time based off of the tail, right? The number of basis points back that the bid was for this bond. But again, rally, a rally in treasury happened in the week, in the days and weeks before the auction, right? Treasuries have been rallying for the last several trading sessions going in as well as the fact that they also rallied back this morning, meaning that what happens in the minute of the auction, we can take information, we can extract information, but we at the Bitcoin layer are not extracting that much signal from one auction. Now, with that being said, the weak demand for the 30-year part of the curve yesterday in the auction tells us a little bit more about what's going on in real yields, which we will get to in a little bit. Stay tuned for that. Now, the chart that I have on the screen for you now are auction stats for the 30-year bond over the last decade, and I'm using a different metric instead of the number of basis points through or tailing, meaning how what was the, what was the clearing price relative to the level right going in, Instead, I have to you, for you a metric called bid to cover ratio. This is a metric that gives us an idea of how much demand there was for the nominal amount of treasuries relative to the amount of treasuries being issued. And what you can see here is that there's always somewhere between two and three times the amount of bids for the amount of treasuries that are available. And so and we can see here that the bid to cover ratio, the most recent one, while it wasn't a great one, if you put it in context over the last 10 years, it's well within range. And yes, we can say it's at the bottom end of the range, but within range and nothing that is so dramatic that we need to say treasury instruments are defaulting. It really has nothing to do with that. And let me just remind you guys one thing about a narrative that's out there about yield curve control with the treasury part, uh, treasury securities. Treasury bills are at five and a third percent. Thirty-year treasury bonds are below five percent. That means there's a premium on thirty-year bonds relative to bills. So why would the central bank need to control the yield curve when thirty-year yields are actually lower than treasury bill yields? That narrative makes absolutely no sense. And when you hear yield curve control about the 30 year part of the curve, you should ask yourself, well, then why are yields in 30s lower than money market yields? It's because there is a premium on the demand for long duration assets, again, relative to short duration assets, because the market in large part believes that yields and inflation and growth are heading lower than where the nominal rate of interest is, which is right around 5% right now. Okay, I told you we're gonna talk about real yields. Here's the chart for you. In orange, you have the 10-year yield nominal. That's the number you see on your screen. In green, you have the break-even inflation level, which is a backwards calculated number using treasury yields and that the tips yield, which is in which is in purple here, that is the real yield. So the real yield is the difference between the nominal yield and the inflation expectation. Said otherwise, inflation plus the tips yield equals the 10-year treasury yield. Now, what do you see with the green line here? Flat over the last six months, completely flat. Inflation expectations are going nowhere. They're subdued. On the other hand, the purple line is what is driving yields. It is a, an increase in real yields. That means there's an increase in the compensation demanded by investors to invest in treasuries above and beyond inflation. Last year and the year before when yields were rising, it was because of break-even levels. 
Inflation expectations were rising, driving yields higher. This year, it is real yields, and the real yields are higher because the amount of treasuries coming to the market relative to everything else that we have available, it's overwhelming the market and thus driving treasury real yields higher and dragging yields higher. Now, I want to remind you guys something again about real yields. Real yields that go higher make other asset classes less attractive. So when you see stocks underperforming in the last couple months, what we can conclude is that it is a result of higher real yields. Okay, the last thing I wanna talk to you guys about today is the reverse repo market and why this number has fallen below one trillion and more importantly, what does it mean? So let's start from the beginning. What is the repo market? I use this analogy with my students. The repo market is the pawn shop for bonds. You guys are familiar with the concept of taking in a gold piece of jewelry to a pawn shop, putting that gold for collateral and borrowing money against the gold. If you return the money, you get the gold back. If you don't return the money, the pawn shop keeps your gold. The repo market is the same thing. It's collateralized borrowing for the treasury market. So if I'm a treasury security holder and I want cash, I can give that security to a primary dealer. That primary dealer can finance my security, meaning it can give me cash. I can give the security. And when I repay the cash, I get my bond back. If I don't repay my cash, the dealer keeps the treasury bond. And the dealer has made sure that they're over they're over promised in terms of collateral. So if they have to sell the treasury to repay or to make back the money that I didn't pay back in the default, they are overcompensated. So that's the repo market. Now, what is the reverse repo market? The reverse repo market is a new facility, a relatively new facility at the uh, Federal Reserve that it's used over the last half a decade plus to help anchor monetary policy. And what it is, it is a lending facility. The investors, mainly money market funds, can bring money to the Fed and actually lend the Fed money and take treasury collateral on the other side. Remember that the treasury owns trillions of treasury securities. So those treasuries are sitting. They can be used as collateral for money markets. So a money market fund will bring cash, give it to the Fed, take treasuries as collateral. And then the next day, that agreement matures and the money market fund gets its cash back and sends the treasury collateral back out. Now, why in the world would a money market fund want to do this? Think of the reverse repo facility as a parking spot for money market funds looking for safety and daily liquidity. So yes, a treasury bill that is only one month in maturity is a safe instrument, but it still has a liquidity dynamic in which if you want cash, you still have to go to the market and sell that treasury security. And you never know what in a forced sale, what price you'll get. Even if it is one penny off of your expected return, that can materially impact the returns of a money market fund. So RRP is a parking spot for money market funds that are looking for daily liquidity for their cash. So when this, now let's look at the chart here. When this number is above $2 trillion for basically the entire 2022 and into 2023, that means that every single day, money market funds are bringing about $2 trillion to the Fed, parking it there, taking treasury collateral. And honestly, because it's the Fed, they wouldn't even need the collateral. They would probably trust the Fed that they would return the money the next day. The money comes back to the money market fund with interest. That's why they do it. The interest rate is the floor of monetary policy. That would put this rate at about five and a quarter percent today. And that five and a quarter percent is, of course, divided by 360 because you only get that rate for one night worth of interest. And that one night worth of interest or three nights worth of interest, if it's a Friday to Monday, that money comes back and accrues to the money market fund and the money market fund investors. So why was this number now 
above $2 trillion for such a long time. Because when rates were going up at the Fed, meaning they were hiking rates, it is best for the money market fund to just park the money every night because the day after the rate hike, the Fed will pay you the new higher rate. It's the Fed's facility. And when the Fed hikes rates, it hikes rates on all its facilities, including RRP. So in rate hiking cycles, the demand for RRP should rise. And that's exactly what you see here. In 2021, inflation got off the ground, pricing and rate cuts, uh, sorry, rate hikes, rate hikes got off the ground in 2022. And that's why you see this number skyrocketing, a search for daily liquidity in an environment in which interest rates are rising. Because remember, if you own fixed income securities and rates rise, your price declines. But if you own a daily security, you never have price risk because it always matures at par the next day. So the flight to safety in a rising rate environment, a flight to safety from duration, meaning from interest rate risk, even a 12-month bill will decline in price as rates increase. As long as you need liquidity, you might need to take a loss on that security. So now we talked about why it rose. Now, why is it falling? It's the other side of the coin. We're talking about no more rate hikes. And so if you don't have any more rate hikes, what is the need to keep your money in a daily instrument? Actually, you would like to lock up higher yields as you expect rates will probably come down over the medium term. So instead of needing a daily instrument, why not take on some duration or some interest rate risk or at least try to pick up a yield advantage over this facility, which is at the floor of what would be available in the market. Now, remember, bills are about five and a third percent today even up to 5.5%. That is higher than the yield on reverse repo. So with so many bills coming to the market with a treasury deficit, those bills are now cheap to reverse repo. So if you're a money market investor, and I've sat in that chair before, you're looking at all the different things you can buy, and you want to have the most liquidity and the most yield at the same time, and you have to trade off between the two. So in this environment... I would be choosing for yield instead of liquidity, as opposed to when you elect for liquidity, when you expect rates to be increased tomorrow or next week at the Fed. Well, if you don't expect them to be increased and you actually expect no more increases, you are willing and actually wanting to put money into T-bills and pick up that yield advantage relative to RRP. So with this number falling, what we see here is that this extra slosh of liquidity that was being held at the Fed is now finding its way into other money markets. When this facility is depleted, it goes back down to zero, we'll have to once again reassess what is the demand for each corner of the money market. Remember that there's reverse repo, there are treasury bills, there's treasury repo, which is collateralized lending against treasury securities. If there are more treasury securities in the market, there will more be more demand for repo financing. If there's more demand for repo financing, repo rates should increase relative to reverse repo and other facilities. So we'll be watching many, many corners of the money market as this facility grinds down to zero. Thanks for sticking with us today at the Bitcoin Layer. Make sure to check out our Substack publication at thebitcoinlayer.com slash subscribe. We cover all of money markets, rates, Bitcoin, and global macro to give you guys a better picture of what's going on. Once again, I'm Nick Batia. Thanks for sticking with us today at the Bitcoin Layer. We'll catch you next time. This video has been sponsored by River. Make sure you guys check out river.com slash TBL for an exclusive offer and what we consider to be the best place for your Bitcoin exchange needs. I'm Nick Batia. This is the Bitcoin Layer. 
Thanks for sticking with us today for this global macroeconomic framework and how to approach asset allocation. We'll see you next time.